obsession for the last uh, couple of years has been the same as Bill Gates' obsession in the climate space, which is about the global governance of clean energy innovation. Um, when Sophie Whitehead was summarising the previous session, I'm, not, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Is it better if I move? Is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, when Sophie Whitehead was summarising the previous session, she introduced three words. Continuing growth in greenhouse gas emissions, inertia in all kinds of political systems, energy systems, also political systems, and inequality. And what I'm interested in is looking for a kind of point of leverage in the world as it is, which might assist us, it's not a silver bullet, but which might assist us in responding to the problem of climate change. And to just bring that back to the Anthropocene and big history, what's interesting is I think we're in the early days of a self-conscious effort to think about the global governance of innovation, to think of ways to accelerate the pace of innovation on a global basis. So I'll go into some details of this now in this particular context. And um, because the Paris conference is not over, I'm going to speak about an announcement from day one of the conference, which was this mission innovation proposal. I'll give you a little details of in a moment. But basically, it was 20 countries getting together and promising to double their innovation expenditure in clean energy over the next five years. Okay, so after decades of falling expenditure on energy research, it's a promise to double it. Now, one of the fundamental worries that I have, this is an announcement. Obviously, these two people, Bill Gates and Barack Obama, and some of the other leaders are very committed to it. But we've had a good understanding for a long period of time that accelerating the pace of energy innovation would be a good idea, and we have failed to do so because the political context for it does not exist. And although these are well-meaning people, this is not a treaty, this is a promise. And, for example, take the case of the United States and um, the promise that it will find an extra $10 billion of expenditure on energy innovation. And imagine President Trump and a Republican-dominated Congress, and it's possible that that promise will not uh, probably more than possible. It's unlikely, I think, that in that scenario that that promise would be borne out. So um, an argument that I'm making is that those of us who are climate hawks, people concerned about climate change, need to take this question of energy innovation more seriously. And this has been a slightly controversial angle. Many people suspect that those who speak about um, innovation are and you might have someone like Bjorn Lomborg, or you might have someone like uh, John Howard and George Bush and their Asia-Pacific Asia partnership on clean development and climate in mind, many people suspect that those of us who talk about innovation, that we're presenting it as a kind of excuse for inaction. And that means that on the left, on the progressive side, on the climate concerned side of politics, there's often been scepticism about innovation and efforts to accelerate the pace of innovation. And hopefully I'm going to convince you that it's okay for climate concerned people to also speak about innovation and that there is a real need for it. And that perhaps some people are hypocritical when they've put their names to this mission innovation statement, but that our job as citizens is to hold even hypocritical leaders to up to their pledges to make this commitment uh, successful. Go, go, gadget. It worked. Um, so there's a summary of what I'm going to uh, say. You can tune out after reading this um, overhead. Basically, the United Nations Framework Convention negotiation process, up until now, it's given some attention to technology transfer from the rich world to the poor world, but it has given virtually no attention to this question of governing innovation, of trying on a global basis to accelerate the pace of innovation. So there are strong arguments, which I'll run through some of in a minute, why a minilateral, a treaty involving a small number of states, treaty around innovation, might be useful in this space. This is the point of leverage that I'm thinking of. And the announcements, there are twin announcements. One is a government announcement, one is a private sector announcement um, that Bill Gates and Obama made on the first day of the um, Paris conference could potentially be a significant advance, a turning point, but I'm actually pessimistic about it because, as I say finally, without sufficient political support, 
in a year or two's time, we may well have forgotten these announcements. They may well fade into history like many other pledges that government leaders have made at international conferences. So, um, when you're talking about innovation, you have to be careful to tread a fine path between optimism and pessimism. Okay? Now, this graph, which is taken from BP statistical review, of, um, uh, basically shows us since uh, 1989, um, the final consumption and the source of that, and the three biggest bars, the green, the red, and the grey, are oil, natural gas, and coal. And you can see there's quite a pessimistic story to be told there, that in the two and a half decades since the negotiation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we have not made progress. Okay, so there's the pessimistic story. Now, we can also tell an optimistic story. In recent years, solar, has been growing at about 30% each year. It's true that there are now more investments in renewable energy each year than there are in fossil fuels. Um, unfortunately, the fossil fuels at this point is still uh, got its nose in front in terms of the actual amount of new capacity installed each year, but um, we are still seeing a lot of progress in the renewable space. There are lots of optimistic things to say, but if we keep in mind, if we have a 1.5 degree target in mind, on current trends, we're four to five years from blowing the remaining budget. If we have to have a better, you know, a two-thirds chance of success. If we have a two-degree target in mind, on current trends, we're about a decade from blowing the remaining budget. And we are hoping, those of us, I mean, depending on your politics, it might be that hydro and nuclear, the green and the um, kind of orangey, dirty yellow band there, you might not like them very much, you might just want the orange band, which is currently about 3% of global energy, to cover and meet the entire global population's energy needs. That is a very stiff challenge that you're setting yourself. Um, so that's part of the pessimistic story. I'll tell this another way. To this, this graph shows you from 1965 onwards two things. One is global fossil fuel emissions, and remembering fossil fuels are about two-thirds of the challenge when it comes to climate change. So, oh, so yeah, en the energy sector is about two-thirds of the challenge. So there we have that pessimistic story. And then, since 1965, you'll see there's been a long-term improvement in the global emissions per, what's, it's measured there, global emissions per tonne of oil equivalent, the carbon intensity of energy. Okay, how much carbon is emitted per unit of energy. But you can see that since around the year 2000, we've actually been getting worse. Our current carbon intensity of energy is at about the same level that it was in 1990. There are many parts to that story, but I'll just leave it at, it's not an optimistic story at this point. Now, this comes from the latest um, uh, IPCC report, and it breaks that down, so it's a bit complex, um, but it shows you if you're above the line, then these are factors which are increasing emissions. If you're below the line, these are factors that are decreasing emissions. Now, if we think of this graph in terms of the Kaya identity, the Kaya identity is a kind of contemporary version of the IPAT equation, which says that emissions of carbon dioxide are a function of population size by GDP per capita, by energy per unit of GDP, by the carbon intensity of energy. Now, if you're wanting to reduce global emissions, you need to focus probably on all of those levers, but you need to find ways of reducing as many of those numbers as you can. But if you think about this politically, Population is very tough to do anything about, okay? We can argue we should have fewer children or whatever, but it's very hard to run a political program which says one-child policy. And there are lots of... Re you know, it's, that's a very hard space to work in. So we'll move on to the next one. GDP per capita. Many of us in this room are probably sceptics of the idea of economic growth. But remembering that five billion people globally uh, as Hans Rosling says, people who aspire to have a washing machine but currently don't have a washing machine. We can argue that the richest two billion, he breaks it down into one billion aeroplane people, people like us who can fly an aeroplane people, uh, fly an aeroplanes, one billion washing machine people, people who have access to washing machines, and five billion who don't. 
it's very hard to say to those bottom five billion, your lifestyle is too decadent. You should have less wealth. So if we're thinking on a global basis, then it's very hard, certainly in a country like Australia, we can make arguments against economic growth. We can argue that we could all live more simply. But on a global basis, it's very hard to focus on the GDP per capita. Energy per unit of GDP and the carbon intensity of energy then are the two spaces which we can be most optimistic about on a global basis. And it is true that we have made a lot of progress, that's that yellow bar in the last decade, on the energy intensity of production, we are, or of GDP. We are, make, we are doing more with less energy. And so that's awesome. And as part of the kind of energy innovation challenge, are efficiency measures. So that's part of that. But we need to make a lot more, I shouldn't say we need to make a lot more progress, we haven't been making progress. We need to make progress also on the carbon intensity of energy. Now, the problem in my view is that no one's really been focused on this. So it is a bit of a complex graph, um, which is from the International Energy Agency's Tracking Clean Energy Progress Report. And that purple line shows you the share of research development and of energy research development and demonstration in the total research and development budgets of OECD states. And you can see that basically since the 1980s, there's been a long-term trend in the priority given to clean energy innovation. There's an uptake, an uptick that occurred around the global financial crisis as we saw a number of one-off stimulus mechanisms, but that's kind of beginning to tail off again. So our political focus as a global, well, this is the OECD, China's actually a glowing success story in this space, um, but across the OECD, which has the majority of the capacity, we have not had a political focus on energy innovation. Um, and so I'm just trying to check my time. Uh, didn't work. Um, sorry. Um, this is the problem space that the mission innovation idea that um, Bill Gates, Barack Obama, etc., have put forward is supposed to address. Basically, to take that purple line and to double it. Now, uh, whilst we often associate the idea of innovation with the conservative side of politics, there's actually, a v I mean, basically every time anyone looks at the problem of climate change, they say that accelerating the pace of technological innovation will be very, very useful for remo removing the political and the economic barriers to decarbonisation. So what I'm proposing here, basically what inspired me in to go down this path was basically Ross Garneau who, in his two reports for the Australian government who put forward the idea of a um, low emissions technology commitment. He argued that we should, um, on a global basis, it would be economically efficient to put forward about 100 billion per annum to put that into energy innovation. What's proposed with mission innovation is about one-fifth of that, and many estimates suggest that we should actually be investing more in energy innovation if we were wanting an efficient response to climate change. Um, so, um, why an innovation treaty? Because I've been spending some time in recent months trying to, it's very hard for a lowly academic to lobby politicians, but sending emails and trying to meet up with staffers and whatever. And they normally look at me with a kind of quizzical look. Um, and they say, okay, well, why would you make it global? Sure, there's a great storyline from Malcolm Turnbull around innovation, it makes him look good, but why connect it to climate change? No one's very interested in climate change. It's much better just to talk about innovation on its own. Um, so the kind of the, IR, with my IR, international relations hat on. Um, the energy innovation problem is similar to the climate problem in the sense that there are um, positive, not negative, positive externalities that arise from energy innovation. The benefits of energy innovation, both the economic benefits, um, because technology is quite easily um, pinched, or because some of the advantages in terms of the economic advantages from developing new cheaper energy technologies don't accrue locally, and in particular the environmental benefits, the benefits of climate change and other problems. For example, you come up with a um, less, uh, with a uh, low, en low carbon energy source that also produces less air pollution and therefore it benefits the health of a population, but the person who produces that isn't getting the health benefits 
So there are all kinds of positive externalities. And as a result of that, not only do individual companies underinvest in energy innovation, but individual countries also underinvest in innovation. So we have a collective action problem. If you were an economist, you might call it a market failure, where the entire system, composed of corporations, states, individuals, etc., underinvest in energy innovation um, if you were wanting to maximise the collective welfare. And this is a classic situation where an international treaty might potentially be able to solve the problem. But basically, because this is a very long-term problem, like climate change, the people who are harmed by today's emissions are not around today, it's people in 20, 30, 40 years' time. Okay? So the emissions from Australia today, um, their worst impacts will be on, for example, the people of Bangladesh in 30 or 40 years' time. So it's very difficult to get a political feedback occurring to prompt focus to, on this kind of problem. So states have vacated the field, more or less, because there's no political constituency calling for energy innovation. There are people calling for the deployment, and this is great, I'm not arguing against deployment, but if we see windmills being constructed, we think, awesome, um, you know, this is, we're, we're actually doing something concrete. But it's very hard for us to think about abstract things such as energy innovation. So there hasn't been an incentive for states to address this collective action problem, this market failure, whatever you call it. And I still don't think we're in a situation where there, where there is an incentive. Um, so a treaty might potentially give states confidence that they will gain reciprocal benefits. So this is the advantage of a treaty over a go-it-alone strategy, that if Australia doubles our expenditure on clean energy innovation, most of the benefits from that will flow internationally. But if we're confident that China and the United States and Germany and Japan, etc., are doing the same, then we'll be gaining the benefits from their innovation. There are also advantages to be had in terms of the international coordinate, coordination of the research effort. Some countries can specialise. As things stand, it looks like a country like Australia. We have you know, advantages in solar, for example. That might be where we specialise. Countries like uh, United States and China are showing a lot of interest in next generation nuclear technologies. That might be an area, and there'll be many areas where the US and China specialise, but for, you know, this just gives a sense of the kind of um, diversity of approaches that countries might take. But an element of coordination and specialisation and sharing of technology can increase the efficiency of the global effort, so if it's brought into, um, into some form of global regulation. Um, stability of research funding over time also increases the efficiency of research funding. One of the problems that we have in Australia is that it looks good for a Prime Minister to announce that I'm associated with innovation. So, you know, if I'm Kevin Rudd, I'll announce X dollars for this particular project, and then the next Prime Minister might take that money away and announce something else that makes them look good. So you have this chopping and changing, budgets increasing, budgets decreasing. You can have a lot more productivity for your research if you have long-term commitments. And an international treaty where states are obliged internationally can deliver the kind of long-term stability which our chop and change of leaders, chop and change of political parties, political process struggles to do. These are all theoretical advantages. We don't have a treaty of this nature, but just imagine that we did. Um, we might also have a mechanism for technical oversight in funding allocation. When you put aside some money for innovation, there will be lots of self-interested people wanting to snaffle that money for whatever their profit-making scheme is. Having technical oversight into the allocation of an innovation spend is a very tricky problem to solve, but we also need to keep in mind the various forms of government failure as well as market failure that are at work. Um, and finally, and arguably most importantly, a lot of us are very concerned with climate justice and the obligation of rich countries who have caused the problem to lead in finding the solution. However, to date, rich countries have shown very, very little interest in leadership where leadership is understood either as dramatic emissions reductions or international, or basically funding, the green, uh, you know, the funding of technology transfer, funding of adaptation assistance, etc. There is some money going into that space, but it's still a tiny fraction of what is required. It's probably easier to argue for rich countries to invest in innovation than it is for rich countries to fund the international transfer of wealth. Now, this is a tricky area, but 
um, as in I, I realise that it's fraught, but um, the, there's, there's kind of enough responsibility um, to go around. We don't have a shortage of climate crisis, we don't have a shortage of injustice. Um, it's great if we keep arguing for rich countries to show leadership and to address climate justice through international transfers of wealth and technology, but we can also make an argument that there is a responsibility for capable countries to also show leadership through supporting innovation. So, in some of my academic work, I've argued that pseudo-academic work. Um, anyway, um, I've argued um, that the goal of a low emissions technology commitment such as the one that Gano put forward um, should be to accelerate the research, development and demonstration of safe, scalable, affordable low emission technologies. The best way to do this would be to harness the existing legitimacy and the momentum of the United Nations Framework Convention process so that it, was, it would be incorporated within national pledges with a review mechanism so that the international community checks that Australia and other states have lived up to their pledges. Secondly, these pledges should be binding and verifiable, as many of us would argue that emission reductions pledges should be. And third, that expert scientific networks and participating governments ought to play a role in coordinating that. Now, at the moment, we have none of these benefits in the mission innovation um, proposal, or not proposal, the pledge that 20 countries signed up to on the first day of the Paris conference. Um, perhaps this will be the first step. Sorry, this, this is my final slide. It shows you um, who the Mission Innovation members are. Quite an interesting international distribution of both developed and developing countries. When I was talking, um, kind of name dropping here, I don't really talk to Julie Bishop's um, climate advisor, but I was chatting to him a couple of weeks ago trying to sell this idea to him um, and he said, yeah, this will never fly through the United Nations process because the G77, the developing countries, will say, this isn't about innovation, that's your business. This is about you making pledges and you promising the transfer of existing technology and supporting adaptation and low carbon projects in the developing world. And those are important things that also need to be supported. But um, what one of the interesting and promising things about the Mission Innovation Pledge is that it did involve countries like Indonesia, like China and India participating in this research effort. Now, I want to conclude on a positive note, but I'll just dip into negativity for one moment first. Um, as, I, as I've said, because this isn't a treaty, because this is basically takes the form of an announcement, a pledge, hopefully there will be, you know, there's very little detail on the public record. If you look at the national country statements, clearly the United States under the current president cares about it a lot. Um, it will kind of feed into the, this week's um, kind of uh, um, media cycle in Australia of the um, innovation prime minister, but clearly a lot of countries, and it was fairly clear to me when speaking to public servants a few weeks ago, that it was not widely known in government until two weeks ago that Australia was going to sign up to this. Um, so I suspect that we were kind of um, coerced, or we were roped into it at the last minute, and I think a lot of other countries, the same occurred. It's clearly been something that Obama and Gates have been cooking up with the assistance of Gates's kind of roller deck in the um, last couple couple of months. Um, so how significant is this? It's partly a question of what level of commitment leaders from these 20 countries, citizens from these 20 countries, maybe others will join, will show to it. At the moment, I am not optimistic. I've heard barely a word from progressive politicians. Endorse, like, there might be through gritted teeth endorsement, but basically there's not much interest, as far as I can see, in the environmentally concerned community in countries such as Australia in accelerating the pace of energy innovation. Now, this is not a silver bullet. It's not a replacement, as some like Bjorn Lomborg or the Australian newspaper in its editorial last week would argue that it should be, as in they've said this should be a replacement for also trying to reduce emissions, for also rolling out low carbon energy that already exists. Um, sorry, I didn't go through a list of the kind of technologies, but you're all aware of them. Everything from um, producing fuel directly from solar to grid-scale storage to allow intermittent energy sources to make a larger contribution. Um, all kinds of technologies are needed. If anyone flew to this conference, the lack of technologies to support the kind of lifestyles that we all take for granted 
should be very apparent. Okay? There's no shortage, as I said before, of climate crisis, no shortage of need for innovation in order to be able to reduce global emissions. Um, but there is a shortage of political engagement with this question. So I'll wind up on that note saying that this is a potentially transformative moment, but it will only, be, as in we have added to the global climate talks, the idea of self-consciously accelerating the pace of energy innovation. This is a turning point that we haven't seen before. We have seen it in examples like the Montreal Protocol and the response to ozone layer depletion, but we haven't seen it at this formal intergovernmental level around climate change. But its set success determined, it will be determined by the political response in the 20 countries that have signed up to it. Um, hopefully that was a little bit optimistic. I will leave on that note. <laughs> Thank you.